We have a keynote address representing Reverend Father Hassan Kuka, is the Director of Communications, Archdiocese of Abuja. And because we, we want to keep within the time of His Excellency the Vice President, we have also appealed to him to make his keynote address very short. Let me welcome here Father Patrick Alumuku. Your Excellency, the Vice President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, Your Excellencies, the Governors here present, the Chairman of the occasion, I am representing the Bishop of Sokoto Diocese, Most Reverend Dr. Matthew Hassan Kuka, who for reasons um, uh, which are fairly clear, is unavoidably, unavoidably absent at uh, today's event. He has asked me to send very special greetings to everyone at this occasion and to uh, relay the fact that his mind and heart are here with us. He has sent a very well-written paper. He meant to do um, speaking points when if he was going to be here but since um, he had to be away he has written a very uh, thorough paper which I will read and I will read according to his mind and I think it will be as short as shortly as I can so the paper is entitled Resetting Nigeria Culture, politics, geography, and the role of big ideas. All happy families are happy in the same way, and all unhappy families are unhappy differently. Anna Karenina, a quotation from Anna Karenina. On paper, the themes of culture, politics and geography make a rather combustible mix. They are central to and constitute the three pillars around which geopolitics or power politics hang among nations, between nations and against nations. How these three themes mix largely determines what the role, if any, big ideas can in any given society play how they are managed or not managed, how they are understood or not, besides where a nation or state stands in the Committee of Nations. I will divide this paper into three parts. Part one will, by way of introduction, try to define the key words and then place them in the context of our lecture. Part two will look at the debate around culture and politics of identity. Part three, by way of conclusion, we look at the notion of big ideas and seek to understand the extent to which the Nigerian environment details or facilitates the growth of big ideas. Culture, politics, geography, definitions and conceptual clarifications. It might sound like an exaggeration to say that culture is so pervasive in human life that it is in everything that we do. It defines who and what we are, how we see the world, and how we imagine our role in it. It defines how other people see us in relation to them. Culture defines us from birth to the grave, the way we are born, to the way we are buried when we die. It accompanies us, defines and refines us, and it is a mirror through which our lives and relationships are defined. The dictionary 
definition of culture refers to words such as ideas, social behavior, customs, and so on. And today we hear of culture in relation to the arts and entertainment and other forms of social conduct among peoples. From the original meaning of, of both its Latin and French concepts, the culture or the world culture derives from the Latin word cultura, which means growing or cultivation. However, in relation to its current use today, culture covers the way we eat, the way we dress, the way we speak, the way we act, socialize, marry, work and interact, and so on. Culture in this context is perhaps morally neutral and even subjective in the sense that through interactions with others, cultural sensibilities elicit different reactions and attitudes, sometimes leading to incorporation of co-optation. Thus, when we talk of a cultured person, we are talking about manners and about intellect. And this, thus, as with beauty, culture could be said to be in the eyes of the beholder. Or, as we say in street parlance, one man's food is another man's poison. If cultures define who we are, and if we are, if who we are is based on our local experiences, then what happens when we move out of the immediate environment? In real life, when two cultures encounter one another, cultural contact, something must give way, depending on the, on the nature of the encounter. If cultural encounters occur in war, as in British, Spanish, or French colonialism, or a religious war, a jihad, the conquered often end up adopting a new language, a new food taste, a new attire, a new literature or faith. If the encounter is by social interaction, such as through trade, migration, or marriage, then we could see the influences in a wide range of borrowed interactions covering names, covering names or attires, and so on. Now, the dictionary defines geography as a study of the physical features of the earth and its atmosphere, of human activity, indulging or including the distribution of populations and resources and political and economic activities. Geography is a central fulcrum of geopolitics. And geography is fundamental to how nation states contain or expand their territories. Geography includes earth features such as deserts, such as tropical conditions, such as rainforests or rivers or mountains or lakes or seas. In a way, buried in the womb of geography are resources around which national conflicts have to revolve over time. It is geography that has driven colonialism and today it also drives global politics and financial markets. On the shoulders of geography rests the opportunities to be rich or to be poor. The Geographical Society of London has found or was founded in 1830 and laid the foundation for colonial expeditions. This was well before the famous Berlin Conference of 1884, which built on the various discoveries of resources around the world. On February 5th, 1885, King Leopold established what he called the Congo Free State and went on to sponsor through loans from his country one of the most brutal economic ventures notorious for its inhumanity. The colonialists deserve commendation because at least they realized that it was important to know the people you are going to engage and so geography so deployed as tools of reconnaissance 
with explorers sponsored to bring back information. Once you knew this much about the character of the people and their geography, you realized that you could take over their land by offering them cheap gin or mirrors and so on. The society heavily invested in, funded and sponsored those early explorers such as Charles Darwin, David Livingstone, or Morton Stanley, or Bishop Ajay Crowder, and so on. The investments bore enormous fruits, as we know today. In his book, titled Prisoners of Geography, 10 Maps That Tell You Everything You Need to Know About Global Politics, the journalist Tim Marshall argues that seeing geography as a decisive factor in the course of human history can be construed as a bleak view of the world. It suggests that nature is more powerful than man and that we can only go as far in determining our fate. Any sensible person can see that technology is bending the iron rules of geography. That technology is bending the iron rules of, ge of geography. Apart from the advantages of different forms of resources, aquatic, mineral, or otherwise, geography also speaks to populations as a major resource. However, in the end, it all depends on whether a local elite understands the uses of the resources and can incorporate the relevant investment. This ignorance or sheer intellectual laziness and incompetence tend to feed the appetite of a local elite, which often outsources its duties to foreign multinational resource, while they and their nations settle for the pittance through rents. This is the backdrop of the notion of the resource curse spoken about of Africa today. And today, the war between Russia and Ukraine is to a large extent a war over the faith created by geography for both nations. It has been argued that had the Himalaya mountains not separated both China and India, there would have been great incentives for war between these two countries over the years. And so let us turn our attention to the struggle for identity, identity today. The second part of the paper then is globalization, culture, geography, and identity crisis or identity politics. Globalization has produced a greater sense of urgency and has also redefined both culture and geography. It has turned the world into global battle, battleground for cultural claims of supremacy and domination. Globalization is a subject of its own today, and its all and its all encompassing nature has impacted almost every facet of our human life. It has infused a sense of urgency in the politics of identity. While the powerful are seeking to extend the frontiers of their cultural domination, less powerful cultures are struggling to defend themselves and their cultural or geographical spaces. The American journalist Thomas Friedman, the New York Times' very influential foreign editor, published four groundbreaking books that place the topic of globalization in proper pers perspective. The four books are The Lexus and the Olive Tree in 1999, Longitudes and Attitudes in 2002, The World is Flat in 2005, and most recently, Hot, Flat, and Crowded in 2008. Mr. Friedman's phenomenal and prodigious scholarship has helped to shape American geopolitical incursions and the extension of its spheres of economic and political interests around the world. He has used his wide experience as a journalist 
to help prepare America to face the challenges and threats by cultural differences. In this way, America is able to identify and try to address threats, opportunities, challenges posed by friends and foes. In the years of world politics, perhaps nowhere has the struggle for identity been more intense than in the United States of America. The nature of the establishment of the country, its quest for cultural and geopolitical domination, its complex cultural mix and history have all lent themselves to this reality. Beginning with the words of attrition to establish the supremacy of the white, Anglo-Saxon Protestants versus the Indians who own the land, so much has happened. Following this has been the layers of slavery and migration, which further added to the layers of oppression and those considered children of lesser God. As the years have rolled by, with education and levels of social mobility among the black people, identity politics has taken a new, even violent turn. Putting these struggles in context is important to understanding that human dignity, human equality and justice do not come in a platter of gold. We will briefly look at these realities to provide a backdrop to understanding how far we have come in the context of the imperfect America, the land of the brave. The most visible waves of identity crisis erupted in the United States in earnest in the 1960s and reached a crescendo in the 70s and 80s as the media created more consciousness and reach. In the course, Africans had moved up from slavery, the title of the biography of Booker T. Washington, to seeking a better deal as citizens. African Americans wanted to be treated according to the provisions of their constitution and the articles of the Declaration of Independence. The famous Watt Sachs concert was organized in Los Angeles, Coliseum in 1973, to commemorate the Watt riots which had, read, which had taken place in 1965 following the arrest of a 25-year-old black man, Maked Fry, on accusations of drunk driving. Those riots, of course, were ignited by years and years of perceived oppression of the black citizens. The highlights of the concert was not the music of Isaac Hayes, the staple singers, or the presence of influential comedians like Richard Pryor, but the rendition of the poem I am somebody, written by Jesse Jackson. In the course of the concert, when Jackson yelled, I may be poor, I may be on welfare, I may be uneducated, and so on, the crowd simply responded, I am somebody. So they say, I may be poor, they will say, I am somebody. I may be on welfare, they will respond, but I am somebody. I may be uneducated, but I am somebody. This marked a turning point over the struggle for black identity. And the subsequent emergence of the fiery black panthers from the voices of people like Huey, Newton, Angela Davis, and so on. Through to the moral tone of urgency, by likes of the Reverend Martin Luther King, there was no turning back for the quest for civil rights and dignity for the black citizens. African Americans would continue to struggle for identity so as to claim their rightful place in every sphere of public life in America. They had landed in America in slave ships without names to be sold like cargo in open markets where they were simply called boy or girl. They would later be elevated and be called nigger or called negro 
or called blacks or people of color and african americans over almost a hundred year stretch went by different names their final destination was simply to be accorded equal rights and to become full americans the struggle is still being waged and despite the black president under their belt despite having a black president under their belt the brutality that led to the tragic death of floyd recently suggests that the devil of racism is still alive well and embedded in the institutional life of america the black lives matter movement remains a signpost suggesting that the battle is far from over the debate over identity will continue and americans accepted that racism was an evil because it was based on culture with pressure scholars seeking the solution seeking the solution sociologists developed the theory of multiculturalism this was aimed at fighting the cultural superiority embedded in the nation in the notion of race it argued that all races and cultures should be treated equally the idea here is to find safe and comfortable cultural spaces for each individual groups to thrive in this meant that justice lay in accepting that each race should be allowed to conserve and protect their culture within the larger cultural world of being American. But years of contestation later, multiculturalism and multiracialism would soon come under attack in the 1990s for many reasons. First, the assumption of the superiority of Western white Anglo-Saxon races in America was based on the view that their races culture and religions were superior to others. A new theory was based on the concept of the salad ball. This theory argued that it was best to simply acknowledge and throw all identities, identities into a bowl and simply garnish these identities as the chefs do while making salad. All the vegetables in a salad plate are independent and they only blend with the expertise of the chef. Properly managed, the state will be the chef, and his duty would be to ensure the preservation of all identities for the service of the nation. A lot of these debates took different shapes and forms for asserting the idea that I am somebody. Music, arts, sports were all deployed and helped to ensure appreciation to an extent that the recognition and integration of black people into public life mattered in America. Inspired by the scholarship of authors like Alex, he Alex Healy, Edward Said, Africans and Asian Americans began to gain some levels of confidence in the fact that they were not what their oppressors had defined them to be. We all recall the impact that Alex Healy's phenomenal work, Roots, the saga of an American family, and Edward Said's orient orientalism made on African and Asian Americans. The message here is that what becomes of nations in relation to culture, geography, and the big ideas is another word for intellectualism. Nations require leaders who can think, leaders who can map and imagine worlds that do not exist and then propel their people to those goals, towards politics. And finally, the last part of the paper, it's on cultural wars, identity politics, and big ideas. The history of the world today is a history of the contest between culture politics and geography geopolitics is the interplay between politics and geography as determinants for power it's about space it's about acquisition it's about monopoly dislodgement or containment or the other colonialism 
and the emergence of the nation state and boundaries imposed nonchalantly on the colonized and often programmed to fail have left a volatile world in their wake. The highest moment that changed our history in the 20th century occurred with the collapse of the Berlin Wall in 1989. What Francis Fukuyama, the American political scientist, referred to as the end of history. Subsequent debates about the future of the world cast as a clash of civilizations draw reactions from those who believe that dialogues of civilizations were the solution. Either way, the perennial question still skirts around who has power and who does not have. And in an extraordinarily beautiful book titled The End of Power, from boardroom to battlefields and churches to states, why being in charge isn't what it used to be by Moses Naim. He sets out how the world has changed and how ideas and not titles have ruled the world. This is where big ideas come into the conversation. And big ideas is the main point of this particular conference. In my mind, the notion of big ideas is what it says it is, namely, ideas that have life-changing impact of, on the larger society. Without definition, we can associate big ideas with such words as imagination, dreams, vision, aspiration, creativity, non-conformity, dissidence, rebellion, artistry, design genius, architecture, passion, fascination, and ambition and also curiosity. The list can go on and on. We can therefore simply say that a nation will only grow if it understands these concepts. I would like to end this lecture by making five points that are relevant to the notion of big ideas and why they are urgent. Point number one, Environment. Environment is everything. Next is nurture. No matter how beautiful a seed may be, it will only grow where the environment is right for it. Next to a suitable environment is tending, is tending. Looking after and taking great care to ensure that the seed planted is protected from destruction by other hostile elements. Big ideas grow on an environment that accepts fertile imagination. And therefore, dogmas, orthodoxy, and whether they are based on religion or tradition or ideology, are injurious to the growth of big ideas. And so although the duty and responsibility of leaders is to conserve culture and tradition as a condition for the stability of a society, we must pay attention to the changing environment around us. Dogmatic rigidity leads to, to rebellion. Whereas it is important to be concerned about social order, non-state actors must not be allowed to use tradition and dogma to limit human imagination. Over-regulation of areas of human imagination such as media, the arts, entertainment, imposition of oppressive religious laws, orthodoxy, produces countercultures of resistance. Number two, big ideas will grow in an environment that encourages competition and reward merit. So regulations are important, but they must be clearly aimed at facilitating and not limiting the growth of new ideas. Society often gets nervous about new ideas. New conformism is often seen as rebellion, and rebellion is seen as a threat to the social order. So true and tempting as this may be, a society must be willing to create an environment where ideas can float or sink based on the environment, not on the dogmatic views of those who assign divine rules 
to themselves in the name of religion or tradition. Third, for any society that wishes to grow, those who lead it, like the philosopher Plato said, must be educated philosopher kings. New ideas will often engender fear and anxiety. Growing or developing a society is not the result of mere good intentions. It is the result of science, design, imagination. Planning how to deliver services requires not only a good heart, but a good brain that works. A weak bureaucracy manned by incompetent civil servants produces extortionists who use raw power and blackmail to hide their incompetence. If the public service does not have educated men and women whose promotion is based on merit, the good intentions of government will collapse. Fourth, education. Education conquers feudalism, nepotism, and prebendalism. Other forms of government such as plutocracy, feudalism, aristocracy, or theocracy will all have their days, will all have their days. But democracy with all its imperfections for now has the best opportunity for ending fear. Replacing the tribe and other corrosive identities that are employed to defeat the principles of the common good. So once education replaces tribe and religion and region as means of accessing the levers of power, then a society has hope that big ideas can grow and blossom and defeat mythologies. Yuval Noah Harari has written quite extensively about the future of relationship to the emergence of the new world of algorithm. His books such as Homo Sapiens, A Brief History of Tomorrow, A Brief History of Humankind, and Lessons of the 21st Century all address the complex issues of the future. He has addressed complex issues such as liberty, nationalism, terrorism, God, civilization, among, among many others. In the age of terrorism, Harari warns that terrorism works by pressing fear button, a fear button deep in the minds of people and by hijacking private imagination for millions of individuals. Finally, does geography or culture naturally favor some people? By themselves, none of these do, unless through leadership, education, men and women with ideas. And in his book, The Mystery of Capital, Why Capitalism Triumphs in the West, and fails elsewhere, the Peruvian scholar Hernando de Soto studied five poor countries and argued that poverty in developing countries can be correlated to the nature of the land and property and property laws along with the quality of the ease of doing business in a given country. And so in all, our failure is in our hands based on the choices that we ourselves make. From the right brothers to Steve, Be uh, to Steve Jobs, to Jeff Bezos, to Bill Gates, to Mark Zuckerberg, Elon Musk, Ali Kodangote, Ali Baba, we know the ideas rule the world. The Nigerian state in its present form does not appreciate the value of big ideas. And that is why men and women of the underworld are now in charge. To shine the light of big ideas, these dark clouds must be cleared. Our brother and friend, Sam Nda Isaiah, lived for this. He has passed the torch to us. The challenge is for us to renew our resolve. And in the end, Believers in big ideas must reset the clock against cultural and ask with Bernard 
Shaw who said, some men see things as they are and ask, why? I dream things that never were and I ask, why not? And that's the end of the lecture. I thank you.